Promoting mindful well-being in everyday life. This is the Pragmatic Alchemy Podcast with your host, Courtney Edwards. Hello, and welcome back to another episode of Pragmatic Alchemy Podcast. I am Courtney. I will be your host today. And today is a very special day in that I have to designate that I am the Courtney that will be your host today because we're joined by another Courtney. And I'm very excited to bring my my name sister and my mastermind sister from One Epic Place uh, onto the podcast. Courtney White Bay is an exercise physiologist and the owner of Hudson Valley Peak Performance. And today, we're going to have a conversation about all of the things. We're going to talk about energy. We're going to talk about our bodies, movement, metabolism, leadership, women in business, all of the things. And so I'm really excited uh, to have Courtney with us to be able to have this conversation. Um, I feel like we've grown up together, even though we've only known each other a couple of years. But uh, I met Courtney very, very early in the beginning of my journey as an entrepreneur. Um, and so uh, it's been lovely to to share this time together and to now have this opportunity to have a really, I think, special conversation. Um, and we're going to talk about how Courtney works with other female entrepreneurs um, in her somatic business coaching practice. And I, like I said, all the things. We're going to talk about all of the things today. So Courtney, thank you for being with us and for joining us so early in the morning. Um, why don't you tell yeah, the folks a well, little... Thank you for, yes, yes for meeting me here. For having yeah. Me. <laughs> tell the people all about yourself. Hey, yeah, it's so exciting to be on here with you. I have been watching you put your podcasts out into the world since the beginning. And um, it's just really nice to be here. So like you said, <laughs> Courtney, my name is Courtney. <laughs> and I started my business Hudson Valley Peak Performance about 10 years ago. It might be 11. Mm -hmm. I'm not really sure. Um, I keep saying I'm going to have a a little celebration for 10 years in business and I keep forgetting. So. We can blame COVID too, because I feel like time stopped existing there for a while. <laughs> it did. It did. And I think that's when like the actual 10 year anniversary came into play. So mm -hmm, I was like, couldn't mm -hmm. actually do anything anyway. Um, but yeah, so I actually, so I started in healthcare um, which I now would like to take over and dismantle and rebuild. That's like, my <laughs> the brain goal. <laughs> yes, the world of healthcare, <laughs> at least. The world, um, <laughs> the world of healthcare. Um, and turn it into a world of freaking mm -hmm. health, mm -hmm. well care instead of healthcare, right? Um, so, yeah, so I, I started in healthcare uh, as an ex exercise physiologist. I fell in love with that in college, like the study of it. Um, chemistry was a big struggle for me. And math was like hit or miss. Biology was totally cool. And when I got into exercise physiology, that's when it all came together. That's when I was like, oh, this actually all makes sense. And here's the reason why we need it. And of course, I knew mm -hmm. there was a reason, but I never could see it in my mind's eye or anything. So that just was like, oh, holy mm -hmm. shit, there we go. This is it. Um, and all the pieces just fell into place. I was like, okay, pre-med, see you later. And I decided to go get my master's degree in that, having no idea uh, what what I could actually mm -hmm. do with it. I can, just can I pause you it. right there? And can I, you tell me, because all the time course. I've known you, I don't exactly know what an exercise physiologist is. <laughs> and so I'm going to assume that maybe some <laughs> listeners don't either. So what exactly yeah. is an exercise physiologist? You know, it's such a good question because it's not anything that anybody <laughs> ever explained to me either. So... <laughs> So exercise physiology is literally physiology, the study of physiology as applied to the human body okay. under the stress of exercise. Mm -hmm. Okay. Like that's like the nuts and bolts of it. Right. So like, so it's like, it's putting the chemistry to use in a biological system. So like, there's different ways that you can look at it too. So there's work physiology. So work physiology is kind of like the physics of exercise. So that's like the thing that's going to make the most sense to people and probably what um, over the last 10 years I've implemented the most. That's like what has to happen in order for you to do a bicep curl. Mm -hmm. 
what muscles and what levers are working in your body in order for you to do an overhead press or a military press. That was actually a question on one of my exams in work physiology was like, explain the physics of an, of a military press. And I was just like, what makes you think I know what a military press is? (laughs) I don't. (laughs) Like why, why, why do I have to know that there's like, it's an overhead press or a shoulder press or a military. There's like three to 85,000 different names for one exercise. Okay. And I was like, why do you think that I know what a military press is? Like, I've never been in the military. Right, right, <laughs> so, right, right. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. But, um, so just if you get confused about people saying, calling out exercise names, like every exercise can have like a multitude right, of things. Right, right. But work physiology is like basically the physics of, of your body movement and how your muscles attach to your bones and what has to happen to get the the um the joints to move in a particular okay. way so that's kind of like your like personal training your strength training stuff like mm-hmm. that and then there's like the cardio physiology which is where i actually landed in healthcare which is your metabolic system it's your heart it's the electricity in your heart it's um the food that you're eating causing inflammation in your body it's it's the nitty gritty it's your immune system. I actually wrote a paper. One of my biggest papers was on the immune system and exercise Mm -hmm. and really interesting. Right after you exercise, your immune system actually goes down. It gets depressed Mm -hmm. a little Mm -hmm. bit. And then when you do it over and over and over again, though, it builds itself up just like your muscles, right? Like when you're, when you're exercising your muscle, you're actually tearing the fibers. Mm -hmm. Yep. You're creating a little micro injury. Mm -hmm. When you rest, it actually builds back up. Well, your immune system is the Mm -hmm. same. When you exercise and keep it consistent, consistency is really important. You actually, you depress it a little bit right after the fact for up to a few hours to a day, depending on how hard you push mm-hmm. it. And, but then it up levels itself. And so your baseline gets higher. So immunology and exercise are also related. And that's a part of exercise, the physiology mm-hmm. of it as mm-hmm. well. So there's a lot of different parts to it. You can take it in a lot of different ways. Um, but you know, there's, uh, coaches, you know, um, in athletic endeavor, like, hey, what am I trying to say? Like college coaches mm-hmm, and stuff like mm-hmm. that, they could do be exercise physiologists. You can have exercise physiologists in hospitals post-op. Okay. Um, and, and that's kind of what I did outside of the hospital. So phase one cardiac rehab would be, you just had a surgery and, your exercise physiologist phase one is the person sometimes who will get you out of bed and have you walk a couple steps or whatever. That could also be a physical therapist. It's a little bit muddy waters. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, but that is something that, that we can do in our, um, our specialty mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. phase two and three, that's, that's outpatient phase two and three cardiac rehab. That's where I was. That's where you had a heart attack or some sort of an incident and um, it can also be lung problems. Mm-hmm. That's if insurance companies and the hospital that uh, hosts these programs <laughs> actually decide that, that that is a worthy enough sure. cause to help people get better. Yeah. Health. Yeah. I love, uh, I love that part of the system. <laughs> yeah. It's yeah. so great. <laughs> Where some ex- so actuary remember- in, in a cubicle somewhere mm-hmm. is like, well, you know what, maybe you don't really need to have your lungs, you know, at full capacity. Okay. That's fine. <laughs> yeah, you can lose up to like 75% of your lung volume before knowing you actually have a problem. So it's really fantastic that they won't cover yeah, that. Yeah, yep. um, I remember I remember being at work locally in a hospital here and um, my coworkers were looking over a new intake chart and they kind of were looking at the codes and I, I was per diem at the time, so I didn't really know that much about the mm-hmm. codes and stuff. Um, but they were looking at it and they were looking at the referring physician and they were like, we can't take this patient into our program. And I was like, well, why not? And they're like, well, because the doctor's actually fudging the code. Oh, geez. Like this patient has a lung problem, not a heart problem. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And this is not a lung friendly program. Gotcha. Oh, so good. So good. So I'm assuming so that good. some of this <laughs> culture is what led to your shifting perspectives. But what uh, what was that journey like for you, kind of moving away from traditional uh, medicine and healthcare and, and into the frameworks that you that you work with now? Well, this multifaceted, you know, a large part of it, yeah, was the toxicity of the healthcare system itself. Mm-hmm. Um, 
And sometimes the people within it, I worked for some doctors who were just really bad, like just bad people. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, And that was not great. But then also the system, it doesn't work for the patients, which really just, um, I think I got really depressed actually Mm -hmm, about mm -hmm, it because mm -hmm. um, another part of what I did was the stress testing. Um, earlier on, I did a lot of stress testing and the doctor I worked with primarily would pull people out of the waiting room that that got there eight o'clock in the morning for an eight 30 appointment or whatever. And he would show up at 10 o'clock. They'd be in the waiting room for an hour, two hours before he even got into the office, his own office. And then he was flustered. So he would just point to them and tell them to come get a test done by me. And all of a sudden, I'm like, okay, take your shirt off. (laughs) Take your shirt off and jump on this bicycle while I put this mask over your face and you think you can't breathe for an hour. Like, it it was awful. It was really awful. And, um, you know, I was kind of expected to stay late and I was young, so I did. And financially, that just led to this shitstorm where... You know, if I needed to leave on time, I got in trouble (laughs) and then I got pregnant and uh, like it all just culminated. I was like, I can't do this anymore. Like I, I'm not kidding when I came home and said, I I complained every single day. And my husband told me to quit my job like every single day. And I was like, how could you tell me to do that? (laughs) This is my my career. I worked really hard for this degree. Right, right, right. And I still feel like that, but like I, but also it was a toxic work environment. And when it, when nuts and bolts came down to it financially, I would have pushed through it because that's the type of person I was back then. Um, I think I've grown since then spiritually. Right, (laughs) right, right, right. To know that my spirit was like, just not cool. That was never going to be good. Um, But I was making numbers here, $36,000 a year minus a bunch for insurance and taxes. I was coming home with like maybe eight or nine hundred dollars every two weeks I think my apartment was nine hundred a month with black mold um then all the other expenses and then I got pregnant and we got married and I got pregnant and um child care was a minimum I would say of twenty five thousand dollars yeah a year. yeah that sounds about right so yeah and I was in the DC metro area so you had to like be clairvoyant, like you had to know six to nine months before you got pregnant because it was like an 18 month. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, so like I just I was so lucky. I just I had some neighbors that were just like super great people and they watched the baby for like the few weeks that I went back to work um, and then promptly kind of just quit. I couldn't I couldn't do it. Um, but for a little while they watched the baby and then I was just done. I was like, okay, I can't do this anymore. Like I was going to, I was going to have to pay money. To yes. Work. Yeah. I was going to pay hundreds of dollars a yep. month yep. to actually work. And I was like, I can't do yeah. this. Yeah. It's toxic. It's horrible. I'm miserable. And I'm not going to raise my own kid and pay to not raise my right, kid. Like, right. 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 And so that, that led to Hudson Valley peak performance directly or was there, or were there stops yeah. along the way? Well, I, I became a stay-at-home mom. Um, got really bored doing that. <laughs> um, completely stir crazy. Not that I didn't try to do lots of stuff with her, but by the time she was like nine months old, maybe ten months, I was like, I can't do this anymore. <laughs> like, I can't only do this anymore. And that's when I started having probably people. Okay. So yeah, it pretty direct. Not really any like loop like stuff. I just I needed to do something, and I didn't know what else to do and I couldn't get a regular job because I couldn't afford childcare because if I wasn't working for myself nobody was going to pay me enough to cover childcare. Right. Child care. Right. Yeah. No, nope. I I know that. I know that gig. Yeah. <laughs> I oh, think the struggles of America. I know. I know. I know. Yeah, and I think just based on the demographic of our listeners, I'm sure lots of folks can relate to that to that struggle. 
And so even in the time I've known you, I've seen your focus shift. When we first connected, you were primarily, its at least from my vantage point, doing personal training. And now you've really moved more um, into the somatic business coaching program, which I'm hoping you'll talk about. And, and it seems like a more holistic um, approach than what people might think of when they think about strictly personal training. So where where are you now and what are what is the focus of the work that you're doing with your clients? Yeah, so I'd say there's kind of like three main legs right now, which are all totally intertwined. Like I will separate them, but there's not really any separation. Right. Yep. You know I, mean? like, <laughs> I do. It's like saying it's like saying, oh, you like you have anxiety and you have a stomach ache. Like they're two separate things. Right. No, they're right. not. They're the same mm-hmm. thing. <laughs> Um, so I still do the personal training. I absolutely love that. I, I have to say, like, I don't think I've ever had a client that I haven't loved working with, um, which I count myself so lucky for, for that experience, because I've definitely had experiences in the work, regular workplace where that's obviously not the case. Um, but the personal training, I, I really, everything I do is really client led. So the client led personal training, um, really focuses on the individual as they come. A lot of times people will be like, oh, I can't run. I can't do personal training because I can't run. I can't do this program because I can't squat. I can't do this because I can't. And it's like, no, no, no. Like you don't have to do any given thing in order to create physical health for yourself. It just is a matter of where do we start today? Every day we get started. You know, I say this to everybody like almost daily. Every body is different everybody is different every day. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. So I will have clients come in and they're, you know, like last week they were totally fine, could do whatever I told them to do. And then they come in the next week and they literally can barely get out of their car. You know what I mean? And it's just a matter of managing that where we'll get halfway through a workout and they'll get like a crick in their back or something like that. Or I'll notice that their range of motion isn't really very good. And I'm like, hmm, that's a little bit funny. Like, how does it feel? Oh, does it feel funky? Well, let's stop doing that. Like, well, but we're not done. I, it's like, I don't care. But, but like, it's arbit- that's arbitrary. Like, let's stop what we're doing and do these three things. We do these three things. We go back and they can do it perfectly. You know, it's just, or maybe they can't and we skip it for that day. And that's fine. But you're not going to get the advantage by pushing yourself through something your body is not primed to do. So that's really where I focus with that. And of course, um, always recommendations and referrals for different things. I love to use essential oils for sure. I've got some really high quality supplements that I love to, to recommend for sure. Um, if that's something in somebody's wheelhouse. And I also notice a lot, like there's a lot of need for coaching and for therapy as well with my clients. Mm -hmm. And so if they don't already have a coach or a therapist in a certain realm, then that is something that I will refer out to. And I've been working really hard over the last few years to, to build that referral base. So it's not just like talk therapy, um, but it's also like for weight management, like do people come to me for that? Yeah, sort of not primarily. It's sort of like a secondary thing, weight management. Mm -hmm. And for me personally, Um, but there's, you know, nutritionists and like food or weight loss coaches that take just like this perspective of self first and kind of like, let's do the self love portion Mm -hmm. first before you focus on like, I'm going to be happy when Yes, it's like, Mm -hmm. you know, Mm -hmm. so I like to build all of that stuff into my practice so that I have those referral partners, even if I touch on it, like if I don't go that deep into that aspect, I like to have that. And that's the same for the somatic business coaching program. Mm -hmm. That is a six month program. I have it set up so it can either be one-on-one and it's literally a personal training style session or group personal training style session. So you're going through the same exercises and Mm -hmm. stuff. You're getting all the same physical benefits. The difference is, is that, and this was developed because I had personal training clients who were entrepreneurs Mm -hmm. and a lot of them were mothers too, but who were entrepreneurs and this just kept coming up again. Business, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) their business, ideas, struggles, hopes, concerns. It was the topic of conversation. I was like, well, why is this, why don't I make this a thing? Right, right, right. Why? 
you know, like why not create this so that they walk in knowing that they can focus on talking about their business. And the beauty of it is, is that I've created a conversational framework that dovetails with the, the actual personal training session. So your warm up is naturally your brain dump. <laughs> you know, like you start moving and just stuff just starts flying, yeah, right? Yeah. You're, you're not even really thinking at that point. You're just talking. And just this like draining out, right? And then your exercise portion, right now you're focusing. You're focusing on moving your body in certain ways. And you can really start to focus in on one, maybe two things from the brain dump. Um, I have an example that I love to use that uh, one of my clients who was a, just a regular personal training client decided to buy a horse farm. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and so all of a sudden the conversation went from like, well, she's Korean too. So like it went from like delicious Korean food and kids <laughs> to like, how in the world do you run a horse okay. farm? Okay. And it was so cool because it, it really just like made you think outside of the box. Be like, how do I hire and retain people for this sort of a thing? And that's a question I think a lot of business people have is like, how do I retain employees? Mm -hmm. Right. And I think Simon Sinek, Sinek, I don't know how to say his name, but I'm sure you know. Yeah. His. I'm familiar he with is the name. Yeah. Fabulous. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. He's so good. But how do you apply that knowledge to specifically retaining employees for a horse farm? Right, 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 right. Like that's not like something he really goes over. So we came up with some like really cool ideas. Like one thing is like, what's the value system of your business, mm -hmm. right? It's, you have to have somebody who values being outdoors, that values animals, that um, has empathy, safety, right? work ethic that they're going to show up even when it's rainy and snowy because horses still need to right rain, mm -hmm. you know like mm -hmm. yeah. they, don't they don't take the day off for bad weather <laughs> exactly yeah. yeah um and so we came up with some cool stuff like okay well let's what if you reached out to 4-h graduates what if you reached out to um you know the waldorf schools in the area that you know, they take their kids to farms every year is for field trips and have them muck out stalls. Like I was a Waldorf kid and I remember that very vividly, you know, like who are the people and where do those people live um, that are going to be the best employees for that specific arena? And you could obviously extrapolate that to anything, but I think, you know, having, having your body moving really it oxygenates the brain it, it boosts um lots of different hormones and physiologically actually makes you more assertive and more confident so the ideas that you had which you might have dismissed as like oh well i don't know maybe not like while you're sitting down become tremendously profound when you're standing up and 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 working out you know and that's why it's, I think it's so powerful. Right, right. It makes me remember when I used to be a runner um, before I stopped running. <laughs> also. You are still a runner. You're just taking a break. It's been, it's been about two years. I've been taking a break for about two That's years. Okay. Um, but too. even, yeah, you know, to that point, even if I go out for a walk, um, some of my most creative ideas come during that time. And I can remember um, – I use a block schedule. And so whenever I had a creative block to do marketing stuff, graphics for promotions, a blog post, whatever, I would always schedule that immediately after my run. Um, and I used to think about the time running as like churning the butter. <laughs> like it was just yeah. like getting all of that up, you know, and, and moving it around a little bit. And then when I would come back, you know, home or to my office after that run, I just always felt just, yeah, like awake and ready and creative and ideas were, were mm -hmm. flowing. I also just um, saw an article recently, and I can't remember where. I'm really, I should keep track of stuff so I can cite it appropriately when I talk about it. But I just saw a really beautiful um, piece on the Buddhist belief around 
uh, like basically vistas and skylines and how the vastness of what our eyes can take in reciprocate in our thought processes. So that when we look at really beautiful skylines, which around here, we are blessed with some of the most beautiful skylines, Mm -hmm. that that actually um, opens up all of the good things, our compassion, our creativity, our connectedness. Um, And so I just like to remember that too, you know, when I'm out taking a walk and catch a glimpse of the, of the Schwangungs or the Catskills to just be like, okay, use this now. This is very helpful. (laughs) Very helpful eye candy. That reminds me. So I was just listening to Brene Brown's Atlas of the Heart. Have you read it? I have it. I haven't read it. No, it's on my bookshelf looking pretty. (laughs) <laughs> it is pretty it is pretty i'm listening to it on audiobook but i'm kind of thinking like it's honestly like a like an encyclopedia of emotions. yes like i feel like it it might actually be better as a desk right book, to like right? refer like, to it thinking, yeah like yeah. hard hard copy even which i saw on target the other yes. day <laughs> but, yes. um, but she talks about oh gosh what is it awe yes she talks a lot about yeah. awe and wonder and curiosity Awe and wonder. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Awe and those are the two that I'm thinking of. And awe and wonder. And one of them, um, and she says she has got like pictures in the book. Like she had an artist do some illustrations. And like one of them is looking up at the sky and feeling small, not in a bad way, but recognizing how small you are. And just knowing that you're like a, a just a tiny piece of this incredibly complex universe and just to be in complete awe. Yeah, yeah, Is that yeah, awe? yeah. That's that's awe. Right, as, that's my whole spiritual practice whereas, right there. <laughs> yeah. Actually. So it's yeah. like very like outside, like you don't have to do anything, you don't have to be in it. There's no there's nowhere for you to go. You're just an observer. Whereas wonder wonder peaks curiosity you look at something like a butterfly or something and you're like oh wow like that's really wonderful (laughs) and then you want to explore it and I just I you know that's so interesting that you're now bringing in like the buddhist philosophies too in terms of like awe and wonder and vistas and just I suppose taking that time to look out and just just be like it gives you, if you're looking at that Vista point, it gives you not only perspective, but I feel like it takes you out of society and puts you just right in with yourself and blank nature. Yeah, I'll yeah, say. yeah. Well, and I think that sort of the the second part of to bring in the Buddhist is um, that idea of wonder, you know, the way that, that you just described it is is essentially beginner's mind, you know, which is this idea of just Mm. curiosity and openness to what might be, what the possibilities could be. And what I like about, you know, taking in a horizon, particularly if I'm problem solving or trying to come up with ideas or strategizing is that there's no confine, right? So, and maybe that's the same thing as what you're saying is taking ourselves out of society, but I just also see it as kind of removing ourselves from whatever boxes we may have been yeah. putting our ourselves or just our thoughts, you know, things, those limits that are imposed upon us and that we sometimes unconsciously accept. I think every time you look out into the broad wide open, you're just like, oh yeah, no, there are no limits. I can do, I can do anything. Yeah. yeah. It's the shoulds. It's the case. Oh, of the I shoulds. hate the shoulds. <laughs> <laughs> hate the shoulds. Hate the shoulds. I tell clients all the yeah, time. I'm like, my it's... least favorite word in the whole English language is should. Yeah. 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 And I literally just read a passage like not an hour ago um, in the Desire Map, um, Daniel Laporte, and she, you know, there's just, just that one little section that basically is like have your goals if you want to have your goals or set them as intentions instead and release some of that goal setting. Yep. Yep. Whatever it is, do what resonates with your higher self. Like we have little less self and we have big S self, yep. right? Like little less self is the self that like we're cognizant of now or, you know, or is the voice in our head. And maybe we don't even realize that we're doing that to ourselves. And the big S self is this self that's connected to source. It's the self that's already like actually realized fully mm-hmm, and, mm-hmm. It knows that that everything there's abundance everywhere and you are deserving and worthy of everything 
you know, and that you can have it and you will have it. You just have to focus on the joy of the experience. Mm -hmm. But like we get that gets drowned out by the, well, I should have a four bedroom house with a white picket fence and I should get married and I should have this job and like all of those things, which is like, yeah, (laughs) which was my first couple of jobs in healthcare. Well, I should have this job and I was dying. I was dying on the inside. And then that translates to dying on the outside too, you know, like your whole body starts to deteriorate because your mind is just not only turning to mush, but being mistreated by everybody around you, including yourself. And it's really just a nice place. And then the ripple effect of that, particularly, you know, coming back to the idea of working with women and and mothers and, you know, how Mm -hmm. the the proverbial oxygen mask right like how can you take care of the people that you love when you can't or are you know are not able to take care of yourself in the ways that you need to be need to be nourished yeah yeah absolutely absolutely and that's like that's another one of my big focuses too I'm so I've I have a new tool in my toolbox, which I'm really excited mm-hmm. about, and it focuses on metabolic health. And it's, to me, really great because I feel like when I left healthcare and started Hudson Valley Peak Performance, I was actually still focused on uh, metabolic health in a way, but mo- like, but through cardiovascular health. Mm-hmm. And I was still kind of focused on welcoming in clients who would have been my patients, you know, who had heart problems or who were scared to exercise because of, you know, they were older or had family history or something like that. And, you know, like having, it's just, everything is just so multifaceted and having extra tools aside from just the exercise, I feel like is opening up a whole new realm of possibility because, you know, like I have this thing too. It's like, I have an easy solution and I have a simple solution and I have a simple, easy solution and I have a hard, simple solution. Like there's, (laughs) you know, there's different grades to it. Like I have a really simple solution to you being out of breath when you walk up and down the stairs and it's to go for a walk 30 minutes a day and jog up and down the stairs 10 times, four days a week. It's simple, right? right? Not necessarily it's easy. Yeah. Hard. <laughs> I was going to say. <laughs> yeah, like, not easy. It's, it's not exactly what everybody wants to hear. Correct. And I mean, that's like a kind of a, a small example. Like it could be, I mean, there's a million other things. Or like if you're in your in a really shitty mood and you just don't know what it is, right? Like I have a really simple and really easy solution for you. If you don't have essential oils in your house, go peel an orange. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Go try to be angry while you're sniffing an yeah. orange. <laughs> Unless you're the like, one person that I've met so far who actually doesn't like oranges, then maybe doesn't. I don't like really like oranges. I, not to eat. I like I like clementines actually, but I don't like oranges. Okay. But I but like, I will still smell an orange because smelling an orange smells like sunshine. Oh. I just don't like the way they taste. <laughs> I like clementines. I don't. It's so, so you weird. Like they smell, not the way they taste. Yeah, isn't that weird? That one is a new one for me. Maybe you're the person who doesn't. like uh, It oranges. might be. There's actually no. a. There's several foods that I love the smell of, and I don't like the way they taste. Uh, I could see somebody doing that for coffee. Yeah, roasted nuts in New York City. Every time I walk past those <laughs> little stalls, I'm like, God damn, that smells delicious, and I don't really think they taste that great. <laughs> And sausage, I know, and sausage and peppers at like carnivals, like smell so good. And I just don't like them. I've I've tried. Yeah. I find those highly satisfying, (laughs) especially on like a really good. Yeah. No, they smell amazing. I want to like them, but I just don't. That's so interesting. I have like, I don't think that there's anything that I love the smell of, but don't like the taste of. But now I'm going to have to think about it. We'll query but our I listeners too. To be... Leave a comment. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> if if there's say, if there's things that you I like the know. smell of and don't like the taste of, please tell us about it. <laughs> yeah, because they're so like related yeah. that it's weird. You know what? I like I like carrots. Mm-hmm. 
I really don't like eating them. Like you just like to look at them, hold them in your hand. <laughs> like what? I don't understand. <laughs> I like more. the flavor of carrots. Oh, I okay. hate eating okay. them. All right. Um, I don't like it. I don't like how it gets like stuck. Yeah, yeah. I don't They're know. a lot it's, of like, flaky. Yeah, no, no, I get that. Um, so I don't like that. I I like roasted carrots. I like carrot juice okay. and I will eat raw carrots because they're good for uh-huh. you and they're nice and crunchy, but I also hate that they're crunchy because I don't like to chew that much <laughs> and I don't like how the flakes get stuck in my mouth. They're very exhausting. So that's a weird <laughs> one. They're exhausting. They are. Yeah. Maybe not as bad as steak and celery, but those are like two other things. Like I really like both of those things, but I just don't like chewing them. I actually pulled in my <laughs> Facebook group the other day. So I make myself a green smoothie yes, right here. I have, everybody, I have seen you consume like, many a green smoothie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For <laughs> this is an audio medium, so uh, listeners at home, yep. Courtney is holding up a mason jar full of green smoothie right now. Green sludge, and I love it. Okay, I absolutely love it. And I posted a, a, a question to my friends, and I was like, "Would you rather drink your salad or eat it?" Mm-hmm. Because it's literally a salad. It's um, it's spring mix, romaine, avocado, lemon, stevia, and wild orange oil. Yeah. And it is like the best thing ever in my personal opinion. Yeah, that actually sounds pretty it's good. It's so energizing yeah. Yeah. for me. It's so good. And it's it doesn't taste like salad. Mm. It doesn't, you know, like there's no like vinegar in it. So it doesn't like, there's no like salad dressing. It just, it tastes like kind of like a smooth orange juice, like a, like a earthy smooth okay. orange juice. Anyway. It's good. And everybody who responded was like, I would definitely rather eat okay. my salad. And I was like, that is so interesting because it's an awful lot of chewing. That you can get into <laughs> <laughs> so what we've gotten to like, really here okay. is that chewing is not one of your favorite things to do. <laughs> Correct. I think it's something I used to bite my cheeks and like get these horrible, like painful bites in yep, my cheeks yep. and they would yeah bleed. yeah that's one of my uh anxiety behaviors I went in for acupuncture last week and she's like how are you doing I was like good but I'm chewing the inside of my cheek so can you do something about that with oh. the with the acupuncture I and she like sure did that kind of but I mean like I will be chewing my food and chomp down oh my I gotcha yeah 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 and like literally be a yeah mess. okay yeah though that's different but I have Chewed on my cheek yeah, before. Yeah. Actually, I've done that in a long time. <laughs> it's kind of a yeah. No, I do it. I do it when I'm all when I'm all anxious. Shifting shifting gears a little bit <laughs> now that we've covered chewing <laughs> sufficiently. Very yeah. So one of the things that I always try to do um, with this platform is give folks takeaways and you know things that they can start making changes in right away. So you're, you were just talking a a minute ago about metabolic health and I guess maybe first explaining what that is, what you mean by that. Um, and then just some ways that like really concrete, tangible ways that listeners can start to make improvements in that area. If, if this resonates with them as something they'd like to, to work on. Totally. All right. So metabolic health. She, okay. I can see Courtney, you all can't, she just pulled out a notebook. So <laughs> get, get ready. <laughs> she she just, she just pulled out notes. <laughs> all right. It's just loose. Take it away. <laughs> okay. So, okay. I could so nerd out and I'm not going to do that. I promise I'm not going to nerd out on you, but I just needed a couple of just reminders, my printer. No, that's okay. So it's better. Okay. So when you think metabolic health, okay, you have a metabolic system, you have an endocrine system, you have a digestive system, you have a cardiovascular system, you have a pulmonary system, right? Okay. These are all of the things that make our bodies go. Metabolic system, endocrine system, those things are more of the nitty gritty. They're the, the chemicals and the hormones and the building blocks that create cells that create the systems that pump the blood, Mm -hmm. right? So your metabolic system, and I'm sure you've heard of this, certainly in terms of, well, when you hit 30, your metabolism is just going to go to shit. Yeah. Yeah. So that's fun. And that's so kind of everybody to tell you that. But wouldn't it just be really wonderful if they told you how to fix it? So. (laughs) 
right? Like, instead of being like, ha, like, no, like, let's be nice to each other and be like, okay, so here's what worked for me, right? So that's really what I want to do is kind of like get out to people and be like, listen, I don't, okay, we all age. I do not believe in um, like not being able to do something because you're old. Like, that's not true. Like, you can't do it because you're out of shape. You can't do it because you're not eating well. You can't do it because you didn't know that you could do these things to make that better because nobody told you. And that's not fair. And that's not kind. So in kindness and generosity, right? That's where we want to be living yes. our lives. So our metabolism is responsible for our weight, you know, it may be we're gaining too much or not enough. Maybe we're not processing our food well enough. So metabolism plays a big role in that. It plays also, therefore, a big role in our energy. So if our energy is crap, maybe our metabolism isn't working so well. Maybe we don't have the right vitamin con- uh, concentrations. Maybe we're not eating the right foods. It also ties into our mood. All of this is like really about like processing and we need to have the building blocks, right? Sleep is another one. If your sleep is off, chances are your metabolism is probably off too. Clarity and stress, two other ones that we just, we definitely want to hit on. Now, what are the supporters of those things? Like how can we support our metabolism? Now I have like a new product line that I'm using, which is freaking phenomenal. And I am so in love with it. There are many things out there that you can do that you can use. Um, I can go into that, but I'm not going to go into that today because it's just one part of it. If anybody has any questions, more than happy to talk about Yeah, and all your info will be in the show notes if folks want to track you down and learn more. Mm -hmm. Right. But the idea, really the idea here is, and hang with me for a second, and this actually comes from another networking partner that I have from another realm, Mm -hmm. but he says it so perfectly. We want to help people live young and die fast. Not soon. Right. Right. Not soon. But not with these but, diseases but, that draw out that process exactly. and, and take away our faculty slowly. Yes. So we want to live as young as we can, right? And have a long lifespan. Traditional medicine, unfortunately, through all that it's trying to do often misses the mark and it can extend our life, but it does not extend our health. Right. So we're spending some people act decades actively dying. I call it actively dying. We are active. We are doing things and we're getting up each morning saying, well, gee, I wish that I felt better today, maybe tomorrow. And that's not going to happen because you're looking at it in the wrong way. So if so we want to help people live longer in a more youthful state. How can we do that? Now I mentioned the supplementation, smart supplementation, okay? Like I, if you have questions about what I use, I'm more than happy to go over that personally. Um, but smart supplementation, if you're going to use it, you just make sure you research it, make sure it resonates with you, make sure that when you take it after, you know, like sometimes there's a little, little bit of like a, a detox or prep period where your body's like going through shifts and changes. Um, but after that shouldn't last too long. So how does it feel in your body? Make sure that these things feel good in your body before just going and taking it for 10 years, right? Like if it doesn't feel good after two months and it's probably not right for you. Healthy eating. That's like my green smoothie, right? My green smoothie for my health is freaking phenomenal. I can be feeling like a pile of beetle dung and drink that smoothie and feel like a million bucks in less than 10 minutes. I, it it just for me works that well. Next up daily movement. And I'm going to talk about this just real quick in two different ways, because I know we're running out of time. Number one, with this metabolic health, I'm going to tell you that you can absolutely lose weight, which is really great because not only does that make our body systems, especially like our heart and our lungs not have to work so hard, but we feel nice, right? We feel young and we feel pretty and we feel energized and we feel confident, right? So exercise is going to help with that as well as, and here's the really cool thing, the supplement and exercise both build collagen. So the supplement actually has collagen in it. Exercise actually helps you build collagen. Like I had no idea. Of course, you need the nutritional building blocks for this. So if you're not eating enough 
collagen or supplementing with collagen um, enough to create those building blocks, it's obviously not going to make it into your body. But, um, and I never looked at it this way before because I always saw collagen as like a vanity thing because that's how it was marketed to me. And I just always ignored it, right? But here's the thing that is just like a really big aha moment to me now. Our muscles, our joints, our ligaments, our skin, and I don't mean skin necessarily of our face, but think about your grandmother's hands versus your baby's mm-hmm, hands, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. right? Like you could, don't do this. <laughs> you could take a knife to your baby's hands and it will not break the skin. You could take the same knife to your grandmother's hands and she's in the hospital for a week because the skin is paper thin. So beyond the beauty of, yes, you know, fine lines and wrinkles being reduced, which is super cool, your your biggest organ in your body is now super, super supported. And that can be through food supplementation and exercise. And that it all ties in together. Of course, more exercise just like your immune system, inconsistency builds your metabolism, right? You build more muscle, your muscle burns more energy at rest. And so then you are naturally going to build more calories at rest because you have more muscle, which means if you have excess fat on your body, it's going to start to use that for fuel. Um, And if you don't have excess fat on your body, it means you can eat a little bit more. (laughs) And enjoy the chewing. Enjoy all the chewing. <laughs> enjoy all the chewing. Um, another way you can help support your metabolic system is stress management. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yep. Excuse me. And that's where, like, I think you come in in terms of your, your meditation, in terms of your coaching, and talk terms of the the therapeutic, you know, and 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 straight up talk therapy and all of the different varieties of mm-hmm. that. Um, I think are really phenomenal to have. And just that stress management is so important. You can also incorporate essential oils in there. Um, If you're in a low mood, I like to use higher vibration oils, like I said, like the citruses. Um, But if you need a little bit of calming and grounding, things like frankincense and lavender and cedarwood and like all of those like earthier, more grounding oils can be really, really helpful in that stress management process. And there are healthy stresses and there are unhealthy stretches, stresses, but that's a talk for another time. Yeah, that's its own topic. <laughs> yeah. It's its own yep. topic. Yep. Um, and then and then healthy connections. And I just I'll end on this one because healthy connections are are paramount to human mm-hmm. existence. And I always would I I, you know, in my younger years I would have loved to have said, no, exercise is the most important thing you can do to have a healthy body and avoid co- comorbidities, heart attack, stroke, diabetes, all that stuff. It's actually not true. It's actually not true. The number one predictor in mortality is your your connections, your emotional connections to other people. If you do not have emotional connections to other people, I'll say good people, positive connections here. We're not talking about like negative, toxic, right. uh, mm-hmm. trying to fit in rather than belong kind mm-hmm. of a thing. Mm-hmm. I was Brene just going to say more Brene Brown right there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Um. So that belonging, those belonging connections are a much better predictor of lifespan than anything else. You could smoke three packs a day and have really good connections and be far better off than somebody who has no friends and has a perfect lifestyle, but just chooses not to be around anybody. Um, so those are actually five really actionable ways that you can start to improve your metabolism today. And some of them are simple and some of them are easy. <laughs> some of them are simple and easy and some of them are simple, but right, hard. Right, right, right. <laughs> all yeah. Yeah. But I think, I think that's, that's all really, really helpful information. And I think, you know, one of the takeaways, just listening to you talk about the social connection piece, I often talk with folks, I think we forget that we're creatures, right? Like we think we're so, we're so smart. We're so sophisticated. We have language and technology and we build houses. And, and I think sometimes we forget that really we're biological creatures and we're mammals. And I think a lot of what you're talking about really hits that mark that we have, We have bodies that we need to care for, and we have social connection needs that are intrinsically linked with our survival. 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think like it just, it also circles back to the Vista point and the awe and, you know, just being and being outside of the social constructs, not outside of the belonging with, you know, uh, emotional connective partners, but outside of the social contract contracts and constructs and trying to fit in um which is really just a killer to our our creativity which then means we're not living in alignment with our higher self uh which means that we're not fulfilling our purpose so we should just let it go (laughs) well and on that note pun intended (laughs) Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. (laughs) Was there anything that we missed um, that you had wanted to share today uh, before we wrap up? Yeah. And I, I don't think so. I, I think I just hope that everybody takes away that no matter where you are right now, it's number one. Okay. And it's, real and it's true and it's valid for you and at the same time we can always be working on finding our connection and deepening our connection with our higher self and finding our joy not just short term like I really like ice cream that's not at all what I mean (laughs) but like the soul deep joy that leads us in the right directions even when it feels Mm. hard or confusing Um, but that you can really start listening inward and you can really take control of your health. You can really take control of your life. You can really chase your dreams and be your personal version of successful, which does not have to fit into society's Mm -hmm. box. Your version of successful is what brings you the most Mm -hmm. joy, not, you know, really anything else. Um, and if health comes into play with that, No matter what anybody's ever told you before, you have a very high degree of control over that Mm -hmm. outcome. Even if, even if doctors have said that that's not the case, I personally believe otherwise, and I will give you resources that you can look at yourself (laughs) (laughs) to determine what you think about it. Um, But I think no matter where you are right now, it's a great place to start doing something that feels good Mm -hmm. for you. Awesome. I love that. Thank you so much for being here, for sharing all of your knowledge and wisdom with the people. Um, As I mentioned before, all of Courtney's information will be in the show notes. And so if you are looking to connect with her uh, for any of the services she offers or just to hear more about um, these ideas and the work that she's doing, you'll be able to find her there. Uh, Thanks for listening. Uh, We'll be back next week with another new episode. If you have topic ideas, questions, or comments, feel free to reach us at Courtney at shineandsore.com or complete the contact form on shineandsore.com backslash podcast. Don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe wherever you're listening. And if you love this content, please share it with your people. Thank you so much. We'll see you next week. In the meantime, take care of yourselves and each other. Mm -hmm.